so yeah um i'd just like to say um for the benefit of the youtube audience i'm now talking to yara peretz who is one of the co-founders of extinction rebellion in israel um and yeah thanks for joining us um and first of all i would like to ask you um when and why did you first get involved in climate activism and also extinction rebellion and were you involved in any activism or climate activism before extinction rebellion um well thank you for having me first of all um i started being well it depends how you define active because when i was 14 i first saw an inconvenient truth by al gore that movie and that got me much more aware and involved. And that was the first time I actually felt um, so um, frustrated about the situation and like my eyes were finally open and I started doing, you know, the basic things like um, recycling and, and all the day-to-day uh, -day things that you could do. But I started being active really when I, when I went into the university and I became involved in the organization that I actually work for today, which is called Green Course. It's an environmental activist organization and we work, we do community organizing and lead public campaigns to promote sustainable policy. And so I, I started, that's where I actually started becoming active, um, doing public campaigns and direct actions going through trainings, doing community organizing. So I learned a lot of what I know today from there. Mm -hmm. And I work there today as a climate organizer. Um, so I've been doing this for a few years. And, but on the last climate convention, the COP24 in Poland, I, I went there. And I actually went there with this very, this sense of, of depression. Like there's that there's not much to do anymore. And, you know, in Israel, we, the movement is very much in a bubble because the country is in a bubble because we're not in peace with our neighbors. And um, there's so much other things going on here. So the environment is not really a major issue. So it always feels like we're alone. And for the first time when I went to COP24, I suddenly saw so many people that care about what I care about from different countries all over the world. And that's the first time I met people from XR. Um, and they declared that there is going to be an international rebellion in April. That was back in, uh, that was 2018 and was going into 2019. Yeah. So they declared that and they were fill, filled with energy and there were not a lot of people then. So after the guy came down the stage, I, I approached him and I said, listen, I work in this organization, but I want to do more in Israel. And there's not enough direct action in Israel in environmental issues. There's not enough civil disobedience or not at all. We don't have that type of culture. Mm. And let's, let's be in touch. And pretty much after that, me and another friend, he's, an, he's a co-founder as well, we got back to Israel, organized a group, organized an action, and that like, very fast became the, the branch of um, Extinction Rebellion in Israel. There was a whole process, but that's how I got involved with XR basically since then. Fantastic. Oh, that's a really inspiring story, and, and, it, and it, it kind of um, yeah, brought to mind how it's interesting how XR has spread around the world. And um, I didn't know about any XR presence at, at um, the COP in Poland, but that makes sense that someone would have said, yeah, there's an international rebellion coming at, at that event. So um, I wonder if there are any other countries there that were inspired after that to start groups hmm. as well. But, um, so yeah, um, I would love now to ask you because what's been really interesting as I've been interviewing co-founders from different countries is just beginning, just starting to get a sense of how 
there are different challenges in different countries, obviously, in different cultures. And I was just wondering if, if I know it's a big subject, but if you could just say something about the particular challenges of XR or a movement like XR, civil disobedience movement in, in your culture, in, in Israel, in your country. Yeah, um, there are a lot of challenges, I can say. Yeah. Um, I think, first of all, the fact that there is no culture of civil disobedience here or a tradition. There might be a culture, but there's no tradition. So you don't see that as much in activism here. And it's like we are, we're not pioneers because there are groups that have been doing this for years. For example, animal rights groups, they have been doing a lot of direct action for many, many years. Um, so we have to um, create a tradition by what we do. That is one challenge, but I see that also as an opportunity. I think another challenge, which is, is also something that we are going through right now in our movement in XR is um, the, the more um, political issues um, or the state political issues, the conflict with uh, Palestine um, and the occupation and now the annexation. These are issues that are, have been always there. They're, Throughout our history and narrative, it's always been there, but the ability for environmental groups to choose a side is very, very hard because the majority of uh, people who hold power in Israel and their public are right wing and are not entirely against the occupation or at least don't see it the way, the way people who are on the left side see it. And a lot of environmental groups, including people within XR, are afraid to choose a side because they say we need the majority or the people in power to be, uh, to, to care about environmental issues. So we shouldn't bring in these political issues. But for me, that is, um, that is also against the principles of XR. But um, um, as a person who lives here, I, I don't think that it's, that, I think this is a challenge that we have to eventually come up with a solution and, you know, definitely choose a side in the end because um, we're going, we're, we're in a pivotal point in history right now. So we all have to choose sides and we will look back eventually on what we chose to do at this point. And the occupation is part of the whole story of living in this uh, part of earth. So I don't think we can avoid by, I, I, I don't know, this is one of the biggest challenges that we, we are going through because also people within XR, some are right wing, some are religious, some are very like radical left. And how do you create a consent on this issue between the different people that is not against the principle of the movement and also it doesn't contradict each other. Mm. So we are, having these conversations these days and it's very difficult um i can say this is also happening where in my workplace as well it's all it's a it's an ongoing conversation um and w one last thing maybe another challenge that comes out of this is that israelis um environmental issues are not core issues here they're still considered niche subjects so israelis when you when you tell them okay there are a lot of threats what are the main threats that to your life to your life here right now um most israelis won't even consider climate change or a climate crisis as a threat um so that public opinion and, and public awareness is a big challenge here there are so many you know iran and all these issues that we keep getting uh, fear from the government to, to feel this fear on these issues. So you don't have space for more things to, to be aware for. Um, there are more, but I think I'll stop there. Any, any connection with a lot of uh, young Palestinians today, any connection like for them being connected to Israeli groups or Israelis and working together is normalizing the occupation. 
So I highly doubt that XR Israel is a safe place or even a relevant or political space for them to be active on issues that they care about and are worried about. Um, and I'm not, I'm not even sure that it's right for us to be part of the same platform. I mean, if they are organized and working together within themselves on climate action, then that's good. They should keep doing that. Um, and I don't want to risk their lives or their well-being just for the sake of me feeling that I'm including them, you know, because it takes more than just saying, come, you're invited. It, it means it's exactly that uh, taking a stand and choosing a side. I, I have spoken to some Palestinians in different, in different um, conventions that I went to, um, actually not in Israel, in Europe. That's the only pa place I've ever, I've met for the first time Palestinians, which is crazy. Um, and a lot of them said that they cannot work with me until they know black on white, like, you know, on a paper, and in my vision of the organization that I work with, that they know for sure that my organization is against the occupation. Um, because um, they need to know that they're, and I don't want to speak for them, but what I understand is that, and what I believe in that, in order for me to work with a community that is under oppression, um, I need to acknowledge formally their collective identity and what they're going through as a collective. It's not just, okay, look, we have Arabs in our group, we're so uh, plural and you know, peace lovers and that. It's more than that, at least in Israel. It's much more, it needs to be much, much more than that. Um, so, and, and it's also, you know, it's different. There are Palestinians living in the West Bank and there are um, Israeli Arabs who identify as Palestinians living in Israel so it's, it's, a very, it's a very complex issue. Um, I'm part of a group uh, that is starting to organize out of XR. It's a different group that wishes to connect between ending the occupation and stopping the climate crisis. Right. Uh, and, and embodying that in a movement that works towards both those goals. It's very, very in a like its first stages, but wow. in that group, we are all, already Palestinians and Israelis working together. Um, I think the, the most that have been in, in, in like five years in the environmental movement have been in the past year and a half. Um, and a lot of it has been XR and together, uh, XR and other groups, we try to collaborate as much as we can. Um, and the first, the first uh, meeting that we did for XR was brought, brought about something like 200, 300 people that came and wanted to hear about XR and take part. And these are people who knew what they are coming for because we already heard about Extinction Rebellion from the bridge action that you did in the UK. And we also saw amazing things like uh, what they did in Portugal that they went into uh, a media, I don't know, news channel while they were broadcasting, which was insane. Oh, yeah. um, they just disrupted in the middle, like live. That was amazing. So we were very much inspired and people who came to the meeting, they knew that they want to do more than what they have been already doing. And what I felt is that they were also looking for a platform that wasn't an NGO or an organization or like a you know, a long running organization. They wanted something that was more authentic and more civil, um, like from, from being more citizen and not just, you know, active in an organization. Um, and I think the activities of XR also helped other environmental groups, long running NGOs understand the need for this type of of activism and the importance of having um, a variety of different groups doing different things for the same cause. So they started supporting this more and accepting the fact that XR is part of the climate movement now mm -hmm. and that this is also something that we have to do. Um, and these are groups that have been existing for 30 years or more 
and they work with the government and they're very, you know, like in, in a box, the way they think. Mm. Um, so they are opening up as well. So that, those are positive things. Um, and I forgot the rest of the question, but, um, no, that, that was pretty much that. That was okay. it. I think. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess that's kind of the response I was hoping for. <laughs> so, um, I can even say that that even other groups that work on um, democracy, having democracy in Israel, and, and cor corruption mm. in politics, so they have been getting training from us for NVDA for nonviolent mm. direct action. Amazing. So. We're even trying to spread the word of the tactics because mm. we think that it should be in every activist group Definitely. in Israel. That's incredible. That's really inspiring to hear that. Um, well, actually, just today there was an action. Um, I wasn't involved in it, but and I don't, I'm not sure there was media coverage, but we went, we got inspired from actions that we saw. Um, I'm not sure which country they did it, but they used. Um, like a fire distinguisher to, uh, um, you know, like fire out um, co uh, black color, like oh, it yeah. was chalk or something on on a building of um, a company that that an investment company that invests public money or not public but uh, people's money to uh, fossil fuel companies. So, and they did this while Corona was going on to save these companies or bail out. So they went and did this action to, to tell these companies that we are not, that our money shouldn't go to fossil fuels. So yeah. this has happened just this morning. Um, and a big action that we did was um, right in the beginning of XR, we worked together with a local community in the Haifa Bay area, which is um, up in the north of the country. And there's a very big um, petrochemical industry sitting right in the middle of uh, where people live. And it's the area in the country that has the highest rates of cancer and lung disease and asthma for children. And um, people are dying there from this industry. So we uh, decided to block the entrance, one of the entrances to the, to the big uh, facility of the factories. Right. And um, we did this together with the local community, the, the people who are, who have been suffering from this industry for years. And actually we got a lot of coverage on that action and no one was arrested. Mm. And I think, I mean, the, the police here doesn't really want to arrest us because there are more, they are more violent towards other groups. We are still, because what I said before, I think, we are not considered a threat yet. And what we do is not considered yet that much disruptive, um, even though we blockade and we stop roads and stuff. So that, but that was a good action. We, because we got the message out, we got on every media channel, main media channel, and no one was arrested and for us, uh, it, it's not a necessity if we get what we um, what we hope to get in an action. Um, I, I want to mention another action that we did right right in the beginning, even before we were called XR. But that was, I think, could be considered the first action of XR as oh, well. Yeah. Um, it didn't get any coverage because um, the the media uh, channel that we were working with they promised us that they were going to do it and eventually they they bailed out in the last minute after mm -hmm. we were already in the action and today i know that it's probably because the owner of that media channel is connected in personal uh personal relationships with the prime minister of israel so th this happens a lot but what we did is we went and we did a sit-in in um noble energy which is a gas company natural gas company and one of the bigger ones in working in Israel. And we demanded for them to stop drilling gas, not in Israel. And like we told them not here and not anywhere. We're not, this can't be happening anymore. And actually the CEO came down and sat and talked to us. Um, and he wanted to know why we were there. So we told them that we're there for his children and for us. 
and that he should stop doing what he's doing. And we were, we were arrested for that, but there was no coverage. But I see that as a success because we were live streaming the whole action and people saw that action. And because of that, they came to the big meeting, the first big meeting for XR because they were inspired. And that is one of our main goals in what we do here because there is no tradition. Um, so we want to create that tradition by inspiring people and showing them that it, it's possible to do these actions and nothing will happen. But, um, and you can come out of your comfort zone and you will have people to do this with you. Um, so I see that as a success because people came because of that and they were very, emotional for it and we did other stuff as well i i could the list goes on uh, we've did we've done a lot where should i start well in my opinion or from my experience because we are a, a society that a lot of our, the people here have been through the army so we are very um you know, we, we are obedient to framework and authority. And we are trying through XR and through activism to break those assumptions or those um, natural, natural habits that we have gained within ourselves because we, are been, we have been th under authority for since I mean the first grade and up until we're done with the army, we're always in some kind of framework that has authority over us and you have to obey to it. So, um, so people are still looking, even though we have a decentralized structure and a way of working, people are still looking, a lot of people are still looking for some kind of leadership and authority to tell them what to do. And for me, that is, that is a bit frustrating because um, we need more leaders in, within XR, but a leader doesn't need to be someone who gives, who is calling the shots, but more of someone who takes responsibility and just does things. So we need more of that um, from, from my experience because there are a lot of people who are involved, but they are, I think maybe they feel they don't have the right tools or um, experience to take the lead on things and responsibility. And then what happens is a small amount of people always have to be involved to get things done. And that is not regenerative and that could lead to burnout. So that I think is one of our biggest challenges in, as a movement here like the XR Israel movement. Um, and and we, so we are trying to get through with that. We're trying to understand how to get more people taking responsibility and then other people who have been doing that for a long time can take less responsibility and be more focused on specific things. Um, for me, me, for example, I want to be more focused on actions and um, helping affinity groups. I want to be less involved in thing in other things that that I don't have to be involved in. But right now I am because we need people to push through. Um, so I don't know if that answers to some part of your question, but that is something that is is happening right now. And regarding the global movement, I have to be honest that we are still understanding the global movement and the different structures and how things work. Mm. For example, if there's a, a global action, who decides on that? How can we be a part of the decision-making? Um, that is unclear to me still, where do decisions um, take place? And I mean, I know there are um, tensions within, within XR between different groups I know there are tensions toward the UK, uh, U XR UK. Um, I've seen it in COP25 in Madrid. That was the first time I actually saw, you know, I told you I was in Poland and I saw a very small amount of people from XR and then boom, I saw a lot of people from XR. That was very, very amazing to see the, how the movement grew within less than a year. There were so many people from XR in Madrid 
Um, and I saw the tensions there. I saw like the political tensions and the, the, the mixed feelings that people had. And I don't know if this is because of the way uh, decisions are made in the global movement or if there is such a structure that helps uh, dissolve these tensions. I think regenerative culture was supposed to be one of our main, you know, um, vision, visions to bring out, out, like one of the unique things that XR brings to uh, the climate movement that hasn't been before because direct actions have always been there. We maybe intensified it and added civil disobedience, but regenerative culture was, I think, in my opinion, was supposed to be one of the main new things that we bring. And, and I'm not sure that that has been fulfilled yet because mm. part of creating change is being the change and the alternative that you want to see. Um, so it's not enough to have uh, um, citizens assembly. It, it, it's a, like, it's the way you do it, the way people treat each other, um, the way we, we treat tensions and conflicts and it doesn't always have to be about grief, like grief, you know, a lot of what I saw in regenerative culture is a lot of grief on what we lost and the climate crisis and the emergency, but where's the, with the alternative of what we do by how we act is something that we still need to work on. And I think that could help with the, you know, the conflicts on decision making and, and what you described with, you know, mandates, if a group has a mandate and they just want to go and do things. Um, if we had a really, truly alternative way of thinking, then I think that would be fine. And no one would have a problem with that. There wasn't consent toward what they want to do because they had trust in that group that they are going by the principles and they're not going to misuse their mandate. I think that's, uh, I don't know, that, that's, I hope that answers. Yeah, no, that. no, no, that's really fantastic. Thank you. And, and that's helped me. Um, a response to that is, so I don't think you're alone. I think there are lots of uh, XR groups around the world, which are still kind of uh, working out how they fit into the global picture. And it's easy, it's easy for the UK in a way because it started in the UK. So they feel a, a, there's, a, there's a bit of complacency in a way in the UK movement, but in, a, but in other countries, um, I think obviously any country that starts an XR group must be fairly happy with the way that it has started in the UK or they wouldn't have started their own branch. So it's really great that we've obviously put forward certain structures and, and ideas in XR UK, but now I would think that in all the countries around the world, it's partly about with, with the regenerative cultures aspect and it's really important to say regenerative cultures and not regenerative culture, which in, in the beginning in the UK, we always said regenerative culture, but then over time, it's now, now the language used on the website and so on is the UK XR website is regenerative cultures, because obviously what works in one place isn't the same as what works in another place. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about, yeah, I think all the different XR countries groups have to work out which parts of the XR UK template work for them and which parts don't work so well. But certainly the principle of regenerative cultures and a kind of building trust between groups and individuals. Personally, my personal vision is that to create a, a, a truly global movement, we don't just need these like, as, as I think you were just implying by what you just said, it's not enough to have these rules and guidelines and, and it's not enough to have these structures um, in place. You have to build genuine trust between human beings. And that's partly what I'm trying to do on, on this YouTube channel is, 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 is facilitate connections. And like a bit later on, I'm hoping to have group calls of three or four people of XR people from different countries and not 
not in a way that's official or you know trying to organize anything just just talking to each other about principles and and um and hopefully maybe even some people from fridays for future bring them in as well because you know they're not quite so radical but they still are you know that there is a link between fridays for future and xr um so yeah i would suggest that we just need it's still early days, but I know we haven't got much time, but I would personally suggest that we just need to have more individual connections like me and you are having right now with people from different countries, in XR groups from different countries, and not just to rely on official meetings. Because um, I know there are international calls, international meetings, but I think if they're, if they're just about getting things done all the time, then really there's not much time to properly build up any trust because mm -hmm. um, i think sometimes the more we rely on structures and the more we rely on protocols and the less we rely on trust don't we so um obviously we do need structures and protocols but i mean like i'm 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 a bit sort of uh, schizophrenic about this sometimes because part of me is very much like we need to be really led by trust and be very flowing um, and really build up personal connections in a very natural free flowing way. And then there's another part of me, which is like more of a military mindset, which is like, we need to be more like dum, 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 really organized to get stuff done. But I think we need both and it depends on the context, I guess. But, um, but yeah, thank you. You really helped me. You just, you just really helped me then kind of like think, I guess a lot of it is right. not, we haven't got much time, have we? We haven't got much time, it seems. So there's always this, there's always this idea that we haven't got much time, which pressures everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm, and I'm also one of those people. I'm all, I'm I'm living the tension between we have to act, we have no time for talking, but I'm on the other side as well that we also have to develop the alternative within ourselves and and give the, like put an emphasis on relationships mm -hmm. because that's what you said basically relationships is is the way the best way to create trust between people well if we're friends if we know each other mm -hmm. if we did actions together and then processed it properly together then that's the way to create trust yeah. um so it's attention I'm living through it as well, and I'm trying to understand how how to do both at the same time. It's hard, yeah. but we have to do it. Um, well, there are a lot of women, a lot of women, like in the global movement, the global climate movement, there are a lot of women leaders yeah. in Israel. I think not enough. I can say that I work with the Fridays for Future Israel. I've been working with them since the beginning, and there it's very female dominant, very, very female dominant. Um, and also XR has a lot of women. I, I think we need more of that. Um, that's, for me, it's part of, of the alternative as well. You know, that's leading an alternative is, is by who leads it. And not just women, women of color, um, and people of color, it needs to be very diverse. Um, but I think the environmental movement in general in Israel is very uh, female-led. Uh, of course, the C most CEOs of environmental NGOs are men, um, but the people who actually lead and do a lot of the work are women. So uh, hopefully um, something will change on the CEO level as well. Um, I'm talking like general environmental movement, not, not just XR. Um, and XR, we, we are pretty, pretty much balanced. And that, that is also something that we very, we put in the, on the, on the table from the beginning that we want to make sure that coordinators are balanced between men and, and women. And it's not just men taking the lead and actions. So it's both, not just men blockading or whatever. And it's working so far. And we're, but it's working because we put an emphasis on it all the time. So we, I think we always have to make sure that this, this is the way we do things. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's really fantastic. 
for here. I totally support that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's been, I think we should kind of wrap up because, um, yeah. Yeah, you need to keep it short. <laughs> yeah, um, but I've also got another call in a little while. But um, yeah, it's really, really fascinating to talk to you. Um, thank you so much. And, and I'm sure uh, many viewers will find it interesting too. And what I'll do is, as well as the main video edited down a little bit, I'll do a highlights video of like 10 minutes, um, which people can watch. Um, cool. And yeah, so much you've said, I would like to have more more conversation on. Like, um, yeah, like please stay in touch and like we can talk more another time. And um, if you've got any questions about XR UK or my experience of XR UK or whatever, then like you're welcome to uh, contact me anytime. And, and yeah, if you want to, if, I don't know if you might be interested in some group calls, like, I don't know, in a few weeks or something, I want to, but like recorded as well. I want to like experiment with some re recorded group calls of maybe just three, three people to start with, like me and two others. Um, maybe like playing around with principles and, and strategy a bit as well. I like discussing strategy a bit and we didn't really go into that too much, of, but um, well, at all, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, if you're interested in um, some, some more stuff later, but I can be in touch with that. Yeah, that. yeah for sure. I'd love to. And everything you, you offered, I'd, I'd love to keep in touch and, and talk and, hear more about XR UK as well. I'm right. very fascinated about it. Fantastic. Have you got, is there anything else like you want to say to me or the viewers about before we sign off? Like, um, I don't know, have you, have you got any actions? I mean, I guess not many groups have got, well, no, there are actions happening at, at, at the moment, but um, uh, have you got any actions coming up for XR Israel or? Um, yeah, we, we are organizing a few. Um, and um, we're also trying to see how we can take part in the, I know there's a rebellion planned. Um, the UK came out with a date in September. Oh yeah, right, yeah. First. So I don't know if that's a global thing or not, but we tend to take advantage of these opportunities to do something big in Israel. So yeah. I assume we will do something like that. Um, and I'll keep you posted. Yeah. If we have some. Amazing. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. See you later. Yeah. Bye. Bye. -bye.